In the remote rainforests of the upper Amazon, there are still isolated tribes who gather at night and listen to tales, linking them with the animals, the rainforest, and the universe. This is a tale told by Mariano, a great storyteller. His people call themselves the Machigenga. Long ago, in the days of our ancestors, the Incas came down to the jungle from the mountains to trade with us. The Incas wore cotton cloaks, like ourselves, and brought us metal axes and knives and beautiful cloth. They lived in a high land where there are no trees, no monkeys, where the days and nights are cold. This was long ago, and to this day, the Machigingas have remained among the rivers, living in the great forest that we call Notimira, but which the white men call Manu. The Incas lived high in the Andes, where snowy peaks loom over 20,000 feet above the sea. On the eastern edge of these mountains, where the Andes meet the Amazon jungle lies Manu National Park, the largest tropical rainforest reserve in the world. Water tumbles down through the cloud forest and into a mysterious realm of winding rivers and isolated Indian tribes. Amid these ancient and primordial forests lies the heart of Manu. More than 3,000 miles west of the Atlantic Ocean, Manu National Park is located at the remote western edge of the Amazon Basin in southeastern Peru. Isolated by rugged Andean peaks to the west and unnavigable rapids to the east, this immense park, the size of Massachusetts, protects more species of animals and plants than any other place on Earth. Within Manu's forests live five ethnic tribes. One of these is the Machigenga, a name that means the people. Their isolated hamlets lie scattered along the upper tributaries of the Manu River. Today, Manuel has walked miles through the jungle to visit four generations of his family. 50 of his 80 years had passed before he saw his first white man. The Machigenga live in extended families that depend upon one another to survive in the rainforest. In so doing, they have become intimately connected with the forest and its animals. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Manuel's great-grandson, Alejo, helps his father, Marino, make arrows for this morning's hunt. Alejo's brothers are too young to venture far from home. Instead, they spend most of their time close to their mother, Maura. Although Alejo is not yet old enough to hunt monkeys, he accompanies his father into the forest. For the forests of Manu are his school, and his father the teacher. They may walk over 25 miles on a hunt, leaving early in the morning and not returning until dusk. Even then, the outcome is uncertain. A half hour from the village, Marino calls for woolly monkeys. Then tries a spider monkey call. Marino rubs a special plant onto his palm wood bow. Its spirit will infuse the bow, helping him improve his aim. Spider monkeys are difficult to hunt. They live in the top of the canopy more than 100 feet above the ground. The largest monkeys in the Amazon, they are also the fastest and the most acrobatic. A hunter will be lucky to get a clear shot. Their strategy is to isolate a monkey from its troop, then to flush it into the open for a shot. Although highly skilled, Machigenga hunters like Marino may spend three or four days in the forest and still return empty-handed. Alejo's great-grandfather, Manuel, is too old to hunt. 
He and his wife are supported by their sons and daughters. Antonio is the only man to have hunted successfully today, tracking and killing a large taper. He shares the food with his father-in-law, Mariano, the storyteller, his brother-in-law, Marino, and the rest of his extended family. By sharing food, no one in the community goes hungry, despite the fact that here there are no stores to buy goods. In ancient times, however, the Machigenga traveled far through the forest and into the mountains to trade. And so our ancestors used to go to Paititi to get knives and axes from the Incas. Machigingas from all over Manu would go there and trade. And then one day, white people began pouring from the ground, like termites. They climbed over the mountains and killed the Inca. And then they began to hunt us, to surround our villages, to set them on fire. During the rubber boom at the turn of the last century, outsiders swarmed into the Amazon, setting fire to villages and carrying off thousands of Indians as slaves to tap the rubber trees. White people have been here ever since. My fathers and their fathers always ran from them. If they hadn't, there would be no Machiginga left here today. To escape persecution and slavery, the Machiginga retreated into the remotest recesses of Manu, hiding there among the ancient forests and mist-drenched lakes. Rubber tappers also slaughtered vast quantities of game. Only since the 1920s have Manu's Indians and wildlife had time to recover. hosts another type of invader, bent not on destruction but on preservation. Talia Yosa is a Peruvian biologist 
who for the last six years has been studying Manu's rare giant otters in an effort to save them from extinction. The giant otter is one of the most conspicuous animals in the park, not only because they're one of the largest carnivores in South America, but because they are gregarious, and their calls can be heard from hundreds of meters away. Propelled by flat, powerful tails, otters bullet through the water in pursuit of their prey. Giant otters eat fish head first because some of the fish that they eat, like piranhas, have very sharp teeth. By crushing the fish's skull, they kill the fish immediately and then they can't be bitten. Giant black caiman, up to 18 feet long, also patrol the lake. Their prey includes unwary mammals. Although a lone otter cub can be vulnerable to attack, an adult at six feet long and 70 pounds is in little danger. Hunted by man to near extinction, fewer than 80 giant otters live within Manu. Yet this may be the largest protected population in the world. In a single day, an otter will consume more than 10 pounds of fish. For a human, this is equivalent to eating over 20 pounds of food a day. Giant otters are known as river wolves because they live and hunt in packs. Unlike wolves, however, they rarely share their catch, often ignoring their own offspring. Their extended families are led by an adult breeding pair and includes their young from several different breeding seasons. The group's size may vary from two to as many as 15. Although most of their time is spent in and around a single preferred lake, giant otters often travel from one lake to another using the rivers as highways to look for untapped reservoirs of fish. At midday, the otters haul out on the logs to bask in the sun. I take notes every five minutes from when the otters begin their day at seven in the morning until six at night when they go to sleep. Each otter has a throat pattern that is as distinctive as a human fingerprint. I named many of the otters after friends of mine that I had made in the park. This one I named Benito. The patterns help Talia to identify and follow the otters as they form new groups or set out on their own. Like other social carnivores, giant otters spend a lot of time grooming one another. Scientists believe that mutual grooming reinforces the bonds between family members, helping them avoid conflicts, since they must rely upon the group for their very survival. The giant otter, in contrast to other otter species, is a very social animal. We occasionally saw groups as large as 12 to 15. Both adults and cubs love to play. 
Cubs play almost constantly, feigning mock battles, tumbling and chasing each other. Their favorite game is hide and seek. They can be very funny and very sweet. Cubs beg for solid food, even though they're nursing. It will be two years before these twin cubs are old enough to leave the safety of their group and begin families of their own. Each otter group is highly territorial, carefully marking the lake shore with their scent. When out of the water, otters are at their most vulnerable. A 200-pound jaguar may attack an unwary solitary otter but will avoid conflict with an otter group. Manu is one of the last protected refuges of the giant otter in the world. And I feel privileged that these animals have accepted me and allowed me to watch them. It will take all of our efforts, however, if these unique animals are to survive in the wild. When he was young, Mariano, the storyteller, was a shaman. Due to a serious illness, Mariano's shaman soul was damaged. Yet he still prepares a mixture of sacred plants that give him access to the spiritual world. These and other plants are crucial to the Machiganga, for the spirits within them also have the power to heal. A gifted linguist who speaks more than 10 languages, anthropologist Glenn Shepard has lived among the Machiganga for nearly two years, studying their medicinal plants. Before I came here the first time, I just went to the library and looked up Machiganga in the card catalog, and lo and behold, there was this old book published in 1927 on the Machiganga language. And so I picked that up and learned a little grammar, and then within a few months of, of coming down here, I was already speaking the language at a basic conversational level. The Machiginga have knowledge of at least 300 or 400 medicinal plants that I've collected so far. Twenty-five percent of all Western pharmaceutical drugs are derived from compounds first discovered in the rainforest. And 
And yet, by the same token, only 1% of all rainforest plants have been studied. The chances are very high that we could find cures for all kinds of different diseases in, in the rainforest. Mariano has learned medicinal plants from his mother and from his father, and now this knowledge is being lost at an incredible rate. While most scientists look only at the physical reality of the rainforest, Shepard has been exploring the Machigenga's spiritual perception of it as well. For the Machigenga, the physical and spiritual worlds are impossible to separate. This is the spirit clearing, where the good spirits live. If you take ayahuasca, you can see the houses where they live. You can see the animals that they raise as pets, and which become our game animals when released. These are the sankerite, the good spirits that help and protect us. In the dual physical and spiritual world in which they live, the Machigenga have learned to use certain plant drugs that bring them into even closer contact with the spiritual world. <laughs> Ground tobacco is blown into the nose using a pipe made from the leg of a stork. Tobacco is one of many plants that Machiginga men use to improve their hunting ability. And it's also used by shamans to take them into the spirit world. <coughs> when people share tobacco, it often goes along lines of friendship. So that if someone else jumps in and wants to share tobacco with someone, they'll say, no, 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 I'm sharing tobacco with this person, not with you, because only friends share tobacco. <laughs> Well, when I came here the first time, I was interested in shamanism just to find out if there was anyone left practicing it. And so I was asking lots of questions about it. And this time when I came back, uh, I sort of accepted the fact that there are no shamans around, and I didn't, uh, I didn't ask about it very much. And one day he just came up to me and handed me a little bit of, uh, of tobacco, and uh, he ate it first and then put it in my mouth. And that's what a, a shaman does to his apprentice. So he's been sort of, <laughs> sort of joking around with me half joking about uh, now it's my turn to be a shaman since there's none left here. For the Machigenga, each animal and plant in the forest is imbued with a spirit. Even their pets are raised in imitation of the good forest spirits who raise and release their game animals in the forest clearings. Macaws and other parrots are captured when young. Once grown, they're allowed to fly free back to the forest. Because their knowledge of the forest and each animal's place in it is so intimate, all pets are fed according to their natural needs. Young parakeets are fed a meal of masticated banana similar to the regurgitated food they would receive in the wild from their parents. Mariano's wife feeds a sun bitter in a diet of carefully collected freshwater shrimp. This young spider monkey's mother was killed by Antonio during a hunt. Now it's practically a member of the family. The tapir is South America's largest mammal. This one, a female, was raised by Marino and Alejo. At 400 pounds, 
She's Alejo's favorite pet. support an unbelievable number of species, each exploiting a unique niche in the food chain. The rare agami heron specializes in small fish. The pale-legged hornero feeds on small insects that it finds by endlessly flipping leaves. Like all of Manu's species, the wattled jacana has a unique niche. Jacanas have enormously elongated toes that act like snowshoes, allowing them to forage atop floating plants. A world record 1,000 species of birds inhabits Manu National Park. Amazingly, an area only 50 by 100 miles wide contains 10% of all the bird species in the world. Rare throughout much of the Amazon due to hunting, side necked turtles are common in Manu. They spend hours each day sunning themselves and fending off bees and butterflies that feed on minerals in their nasal passages and eyes. The largest predator of the lakes is the black caiman. They start small, however, and are less than eight inches long when hatched. This weak old group clusters together for protection against potential predators like the white-necked heron. These incredibly rich oxbow lakes are formed when the meandering Manu River changes course. Surprisingly, the most common mammals in the rainforest are bats, accounting for over 120 of the 200 mammal species in Manu. Proboscis bats spend their days roosting beneath logs over water. By night, they gorge themselves on insects. Another insect eater, the lesser kiskadee, plucks flies off a caiman's head. Not far away, a pair of rufescent tiger herons perform an unusual territorial display. An interloper replies to their warning calls. Black-capped mocking thrushes join in a duet to advertise their territory. Cormorants, by contrast, have no territories and nest in colonies. The primitive Watson has lived in the jungle, virtually unchanged for 20 million years. Oh, 
Long ago, the moon spirit came down and visited the Machiringa. At that time, our ancestors had no crops. We only ate dirt. The moon spirit married a Machiringa woman and taught the people how to grow manioc and other crops. The woman became pregnant, the first woman to do so. During childbirth, the woman's family thought she was dying and accused the moon of trying to kill her. They angrily told the moon to take her. The moon spirit then grew angry, turned the woman's soul into a taper, and hunted it and killed it. The moon then returned to the sky, where it remains today. Ever since then, our souls have turned into tapers when we die, and the moon hunts them down the night trails and kills them. Only the shamans are able to escape. Without the moon, we wouldn't have many of them. We wouldn't have gardens. There would be no birth or death in the world today. The moon spirit brought agriculture to the Machiganga, and ever since they have cut clearings out of the forest to cultivate their crops. The main staple of the Machiganga diet is manioc, and they have more than 25 different genetic varieties, because if they grew only one variety, then diseases or pests would destroy their entire garden. So instead, Machiganga gardening imitates the natural diversity of the rainforest. By singing to the spirit of the manioc, the plant releases its hold on the soil. And as Mariano plants new manioc shoots, he sings to the plant spirit, encouraging it to grow. Here, in the middle of what was once a garden, Merino harvests a palm heart tree. Much in the gardening is based on the principle of long fallow cycles and the natural regeneration of the forest. So in the first cycle, they'll plant manioc and corn, and then bananas, and then later on arrow reeds, and finally fruit trees. So the result of this is that a single area of the rainforest is continually productive for more than 20 years, and yet at the end of that time, it looks like a rainforest again. The oldest gardens of the rainforest are not people, but tiny leaf cutter ants. Smaller leaf cutters ride shotgun on the leaves, protecting the larger workers from parasitic wasps. The leaves aren't eaten, rather they are used to fertilize underground gardens of fungi that the ants feed on. Three months after chopping down the palm heart tree, Maura and Alejo return to harvest a new crop waiting just beneath the bark. Fattened on palm oil, beetle grubs are considered a rainforest delicacy. They taste like soft cheese.
From a very young age, boys and girls are indoctrinated into the respective roles they will play in Machaganga society. For the most part, they learn by watching and imitating their parents. Alejo's sister, Elena, and her cousin make masato, manioc root that is chewed, then allowed to ferment into a nourishing type of beer. At three or four, boys start making their first set of miniature bows and arrows. Then they go out hunting beetles, butterflies, and later small monkeys and birds. Alejo and his cousin Pedro allow themselves to be repeatedly stung by a swarm of bees. In doing so, they believe that their aim with an arrow will become as accurate as a bee is with its sting. There are other hunters abroad in the forest. A column of army ants has raided another ant nest and is carrying off eggs as booty. In an old garden clearing that has reverted back to forest, Mariano helps dig for barbasco roots, a natural fish poison. The Machigenga only fish with Barbasco during the dry season when the Manu's tributaries are low and the poison won't be too diluted. The root's poison stuns the fish, causing them to float to the surface. The poison only affects the fish's gills, not their flesh. Like the Machiganga, Manu's birds and monkeys also rely on dry season survival strategies. Surprisingly, studies in Manu reveal that only a dozen species of flowering plants provide food for the majority of birds and monkeys during the dry summer months. Remove this handful of trees and vines and a vital food link in the forest would disappear, condemning entire groups of animals to extinction. The Matisia tree is one of these critical links. Its nectar provides food for an amazing variety of tropical birds. An emperor tamarind monkey, named for its regal mustache, is a pollinator of combretum vines another critical dry season bloomer. These one pound primates often travel in the company of saddleback tamarinds and will jointly defend a common territory.
By May or June, the Manu River drops dramatically as much as 10 feet, and sandy beaches hundreds of feet wide suddenly emerge. These temporary habitats are crucial breeding and nesting grounds for migratory birds. Some arrive from distant oceans, and others from as far as Mexico, Argentina, and Chile. On the river's edge, four capped herons perform a rare mating display never before observed. Black skimmers plow along the river surface, scooping up fish and crustaceans. During the summer months, they pair off performing courtship rituals prior to nesting on the hot beaches. Not far from the river's edge, a curious pattern of holes dot the sand. Female sand wasps excavate five-inch deep tunnels where they lay a single egg. The females capture live horseflies, sometimes even stealing them from other wasps. The paralyzed fly is then sealed in the chamber as a live offering for the wasp's hungry young. All kinds of prey species, such as the horned screamer, roam Manu's beaches. They act as lures to predators like the jaguar, the largest cat on the continent. By November or December, the skies open up and the rain season begins. <laughs> to the Machaganga, Lightning and thunder are the explosions made when the souls of shamans attack and kill demon spirits hidden deep in the forest. Demon spirits often prey upon the souls of the very young. To protect her children, Maura paints their faces with a jaguar pattern. Should a demon spirit pass by, it will see not a child but a fierce jaguar and will flee back to the forest. Even hair cutting holds spiritual significance for the Machaganga. Hair thrown casually on the ground could be carried off by birds to a demon spirit who might steal the person's soul. Once the hair is thrown in the river, the girls' souls are safe and the demon spirits can no longer harm them.
At the beginning of the rainy season, Mariano and other Machigenga men always gather to take ayahuasca, a powerful hallucinogenic drug made from a vine. By drinking ayahuasca, the spirit of the plant infuses them, allowing their souls to separate from their bodies and enter the spirit world. By communing with the spirits of the forest, they may gain knowledge, power, and the ability to heal. Kan <laughs> After a three-hour chase, a small troop of woolly monkeys is tiring.
Dr. Carol Mitchell, a zoologist from Southern California, has been studying monkeys in Manu's rainforest for the last 12 years. Carol's studies revealed that even though there are native people living within the park, their bow and arrow technology has had little effect on its wildlife. People and animals in Manu live in ecological balance. From the moment Carol stepped into Manu's rainforest and saw her first monkey troop, she knew that this was the place she belonged. I actually had always wanted to uh, study monkeys, and I was always intrigued by tropical forest. And in tropical forest, you find the greatest diversity of animal species. Carol works with a Peruvian assistant, a Brahm Huaman. There's something moving up there. The Tamandua, or collared anteater, spends most of its life up in the rainforest canopy. Although uncommonly seen, anteaters and even rarer animals often appear unexpectedly along Manu's jungle trails. While there are 13 monkey species in Manu, Carol spent more than two years following a single troop of 70 squirrel monkeys. The Machiganga call the squirrel monkey Sigiri, which is quite good. Most, many Machiganga words sound like, uh, uh, like the animal that, uh, that they describe, and Sigiri is very good for squirrel monkeys because they're very chattery. And the squirrel monkeys? Sounds like they're dropping something. There they are in a palm nut tree. It's a shelia palm. There they're with capuchins. The squirrel monkeys join up in the forest and forage together with capuchin monkeys quite often. Capuchins are the only animal which can open up the initial part of the palm cluster. And the squirrel monkeys hang around underneath and pick up nuts which are half eaten by the capuchins. Palm nuts are an important resource full of oil and calories. By scavenging behind the more powerful capuchins, squirrel monkeys gain access to a richer variety of foods. It was very easy to feel as though I was a member of a mixed species troop. The squirrel monkeys go uh, so often in company with the two capuchin species that I think having one other strange looking primate was not, not too strange for them. They were very aware of the fact that I could not climb trees. To explore the extent of their territories, Carol decided she needed to trap and radio collar certain squirrel monkeys. The perfect lure, it turned out, was the banana. The banana is a huge, very soft piece of sweet fruit and very unlike anything they get in the forest. And so a banana is like, a, it's like a gigantic chocolate bar to them. Brown capuchins are the classic organ grinder monkeys that people have seen all over the world. 
The cleverest of South America's primates, it didn't take long before they began to pit their brain power against that of Carol's. And in fact, during one point in the process, every day I was attempting to figure out another trap mechanism that the capuchin monkeys could not subvert. And I thought to myself, I'm doing my PhD, and these monkeys, I'm having to spend like all of my brain energy to overcome these monkeys. The capuchins gorge themselves, excluding the smaller monkeys from eating, until Carol came up with the concept of super baiting. We'd put five or six whole stems of bananas out and let the capuchins eat until they were so full they couldn't move. And then the squirrel monkeys would eventually get, get to the bananas. Once the squirrel monkeys were trapped and collared, Carol could track the troops' movements over its immense 600-acre home range. Following the 70-member troop from sunup to sundown, Carol gained important insights into how squirrel monkeys fit into the intricate ecology of the rainforest. Squirrel monkeys are very crucial in the web of life. They are uh, one of the prime consumers of insects in the rainforest, and also they are one of the main food sources for a number of raptor species. The reason that there's such a delicacy for raptors is their size. They only weigh a kilo, which is about two pounds and uh, the fact that they go in big, huge groups, and the big groups are very conspicuous. The squirrel monkeys live in large troops because there is safety in numbers. Also, with more pairs of eyes on the lookout, the chances are better of spotting an eagle or other predator. Carol's work has contributed to a greater understanding of Manu's rainforest. For she believes that unless we understand something, we can't care for it. And if we don't care, then this unique world won't be preserved for the future. In addition to hunting and gardening, the Machagenga also gather the fruits of the forest as they come into season. When the first rains begin, a guaje palm nuts ripen, hanging in huge clusters in the upper canopy. The nuts are favorites of the birds, monkeys, and especially the machiganga. Not far away, a troop of white-fronted capuchins also forage amid a treasure trove of palm nuts. There is a strict hierarchy within the troop, 
and it is usually the dominant male that rips open the palm cluster and begins feeding. The lower ranking monkeys must either wait their turn or else scavenge on the ground. As with meat from the hunt, the nuts will be taken home and shared with other members of the extended family. Like palm nuts, medicinal plants are also a resource of the rainforest. Yet looking for them is like looking for a book in a vast library without a card catalog. It is the native Indians who are the rainforest's greatest librarians. According to the Machaganga, the leaves of this tree contain an effective cure for snake bite. I'm taking a botanical specimen of the plant to find out what species it is. And I'm also going to take a specimen of the, of the leaf itself and have it analyzed pharmacologically to see what possible medicinal qualities it has. When I first arrived here, people were more interested in getting medicines from me. Uh, and they, they, they just couldn't believe that someone was actually interested in their medicines. I think they appreciate that, the fact that someone from the outside is willing to try their medicine. Not, not only try it, but, but tell them, you know, this stuff works and don't, you, know, you shouldn't be forgetting it. I think it's important to achieve a balance between teaching them how to use Western medicine for those illnesses that they, their medical system simply doesn't work for, but at the same time trying to teach them that their medical system does have value for many, many illnesses. In fact, most of the common illnesses that, uh, that people get are easily treatable by their traditional medical system. There's a whole chemical and evolutionary universe right here, just above our heads and all these trees, and we know almost nothing about it. And it's, uh, it's my job to try and unlock these secrets. And no one knows the answers better than people like the Machiginga. In another part of Manu, Dr. Charles Munn, research zoologist with the Wildlife Conservation Society, feels that fate brought him here to try and save a group of endangered birds. When I started bird watching when I was 10 years old, I never thought I would end up working in, in the Amazon or in Latin America, per se. I had no idea where I would, what I would do. I knew I was crazy about birds and wildlife, but I didn't know that it was going to end up like this. Anyone who works on birds you, is spoiled after they've been demonic. It just blows you away if you're a bird watcher and you're accustomed to normal sorts of diversity of birds to come to the western Amazon right at the foot of the Andes. You, you cannot, can't believe what the species diversity is of birds here. I find all birds interesting, but macaws and parrots have a special attraction for uh, everyone, all people. There are a bunch of macaws up there on the top of that tree. Macaws are the largest of the parrots, and they're very gaudy, very long tails, very spectacular. There's a family of four, babies and two adults. The one thing I discovered when I started looking into the scientific literature for macaws is that there had been no field studies of macaws, and yet they were so popular and so well known. And it was rather incredible. And when I started to ask questions of, about the pet trade and whether the amount of macaws that were being taken out of the forest, whether those amounts were sustainable and justifiable, there, were, there was no information to answer the question. So I said, well, we better find out what macaws are doing in the wild before they're all gone. So that's when we started the research. The population of macaws in Manu is uh, very high. You can see hundreds in one moment. 
either at some of the roof sites or especially at the McCall Licks, at these play licks in the riverbanks. It's slowly starting to come down. Mon and his biologist wife, Mariana, spend several months at the clay lick each year. And the first one finally hit the clay. Look down there. There are 16 species of macaws in the world, eight of which are in danger of extinction. Seven species of macaws live in Manu, and all of them visit exposed areas of the riverbanks called clay licks. We think that the reason that the parrots come to the clay lake is to help them digest these toxic seeds they're eating. The macaws specialize in eating bitter, unripe fruits and highly toxic seeds. Mon believes that the mineral-rich clay acts as a sort of jungle antacid, neutralizing the toxins. Each red and green macaw has a different pattern of feather lines that's as unique as a fingerprint on a human. By photographing the feather patterns, we can build up a dossier of all the birds in the population. And we also can learn who's married to whom. In theory, we should be able to learn if there's divorce, what the mortality is, how many of them die, let's say, in a, in a given season at the clay lick because widows and widowers should come in without their mates, and their mates won't appear anywhere else in the population either. Practically all of them have Matisse pollen on their faces. Studying macaws at these clay licks is like looking through a window in the demography or whole population structure of, of these macaws without having to go out and find all the nests and without having to catch and mark all the birds. So it's a shortcut, an elaborate, but a very complete shortcut into the biology of these birds. The white gash and the black is too high. One of Wildlife Conservation Society's objectives is to train a local cadre of future biologists who might otherwise not have the opportunity to do research in the field. I'll put them over here. I'll give you the ones that have lots of Matisse. Yeah. We've been very lucky with the quality of students we've gotten from the Peruvian University system. Uh, we've had an excellent uh, crop of young scientists, and they're carrying the ball so well now here that I don't really have to spend as much time in this part of the rainforest. I'm now working in adjacent countries and trying to get the same thing going there as well. Initially, we watched macaw nests strictly from the ground, from a distance. But after a few years, it also became apparent that we should start to go into the nests and find out what was going on inside. Periodically, the young researchers visit the nests, taking measurements and compiling the first record of macaw reproduction in the wild. At two weeks, the first flight feathers begin to emerge looking more like the bristles of a brush than the elegant plumage of its parrots. The nesting cavity is 100 feet off the ground and is large enough for a human to sleep in. Unlike red and green and scarlet macaws, blue and yellow macaws prefer holes in dead palms. A typical palm swamp makes an ideal laboratory for studying macaw reproduction. Probably the most important results of our studies uh, are the uh, results on reproductive rates in macaws because there was a lot of controversy about whether you could harvest them for the pet trade. And we found that a very small percentage of the population, of the adult population of macaws, breeds in any given year. In fact, the reproductive rate for large macaws may turn out to be about the same as for humans, which is one young every two years. And that's not very high reproductive rate at all for birds. So of 100 uh, pairs of, of adult macaws, only about 12 to 25 youngsters are produced, depending on whether it's a high or low year. One of the factors limiting macaw reproduction is the surprising scarcity of nest sites. There are only a limited number of dead palms in which they can excavate a nesting hole.
blue and yellow macaws will actually uh, kill baby blue and yellow macaws, take them out of the nest in order to take over a nest site. Take a look at these eggs to see how they're doing. Macaws lay two eggs almost invariably. They lay one first, and then several days later, they lay the other one. And they lay the second one kind of for insurance in case the first one has a problem. Normally, the first egg that they lay hatches first, and then the second egg hatches several days later, and the second one that hatches will die. And okay, let's see which one of these is more advanced. I study macaws because macaws are among the most spectacular and endangered species in this Amazonian ecosystem. And by protecting macaws and the habitats they live in, I'm protecting all the other species that live in this forest as well, but are just as deserving of protection, but perhaps less conspicuous or less spectacular. A pair of blue and yellow macaws have incubated their eggs for a month. Only one of the two eggs is fertile. The chick's transformation over the next five weeks is remarkable. For three months, both parents spend most of their day looking for food and caring for their chick. At regular intervals, the chick is fed a regurgitated mixture of toxic seeds, fruit, and clay from the lick. It is mid-March, three months after hatching, and the young macaw exercises its wing muscles in preparation for its maiden flight. Macaws are almost always in the company of other macaws, in particular in pairs, mated pairs. And if you see three or four macaws flying, then that's almost always a mated pair with one or two young. There are a lot of severely endangered ecosystems in the world, and we can't protect them all. If you have to protect a few of them to try to at least safeguard the largest number of species, then Manu is probably the most important park in the world to concentrate efforts on. In this generation, it's either going to be saved or it's going to be destroyed. I think it's going to be saved. Four years ago, Marino went outside of the park and worked in a frontier town. He was cheated, beaten, and almost died of malaria. Marino worked in Shintuya, a frontier town only four hours by river from the park. Nearby, roads are opening up the Peruvian Amazon. The settlers who use them set fire to the jungle clearing it for cattle pastures and farmland, and moving ever closer to Manu. The future for Alejo and other Machigenga children in the area may lie in a one-room schoolhouse an hour and a half walk from Alejo's home. Benito Bomuak, a Machigenga school teacher from outside the park, sees his role as preparing the children for changes that are inevitable. If the park were to cease to exist, there will be nothing to stop white people from pouring into the park from all sides. The Machigenga will have nowhere to go and will be enslaved. My role here is to teach these children so they will know Spanish, they will know how to read, they will know math, so that they will be able to make themselves understood. If Alejo grows up and doesn't know his math or Spanish well, then when he goes outside of the park to work, he will be taken advantage of by the Amaricari Indians, 
by the Piro Indians, even by the Catholic priest. While the Machigenga learn about the outside world, ironically the outside world has been slow to learn anything from them. The Machigengas are the true scientists of all this land. No one knows as much as the Machigenga do. A person from Cusco, what do they know about the forest? Just what is in their heads. But the Machigenga, if they only knew Spanish, could teach all of you what the Manu forest is really about. One of Charlie Mann's assistants is Dionisio, an acculturated Machigenga Indian. From Dionisio and other Machigengas, Mun has learned an immense amount about the park and its wildlife. When we first started studying macaws, we thought that there was nothing known about them because there wasn't anything published. I thought there was one macaw claylick in the world, and I said to the Indians, this claylick is, you know, really amazing, isn't it? I mean, so many macaws, it's just uh, incredible. We're so lucky to, to have this here. And they said, well, yeah, it's, you know, the one around the corner is very nice, too. And I said, oh, so there's, there are two. And they said, well, no, there's one up this other river, and there's just one up the Manu, and there's one around the corner. And it turns out that there are probably 20 of these places in Manu alone. Man hopes that eventually the Machigenga will be able to enter into cooperative agreements with scientists and perhaps even start ecotourism ventures in the park. For it is the native people who have lived here for generations that are ultimately Manu's best protectors. It is they, and not outsiders, that hold the key to Manu's future. For Glenn's goodbye, Marino and Maura are throwing a Masato festival tomorrow night. The preparations will take two days.
I really admire the Machiguinho for their lifestyle. For 100,000 years, human beings have lived in small societies, much like this one. And I think this is just the way human beings were meant to live. These people are absolutely free. They don't owe anyone any money. No one tells them when to wake up or when to go to sleep. They choose their own hours and they choose how much they want to work. There's no such a thing as homelessness. There's no crime. They have very strong family ties. People are basically happy. Whenever I leave, I always say, well, I'm going now. And I don't think they have quite a conception of where it is that I'm going. Because for them, the United States and Europe is just a far off, distant place. The rainforest of Manu National Park has existed peacefully on this planet for tens of thousands of years. And yet in the last century, over half of the world's rainforests have been destroyed. Ironically, the West has had to choose between either totally deforesting an area or else setting it aside as a virgin park. Yet native Indians have been living here sustainably for thousands of years. We have much to learn from them before it is too late. For it is our generation that will decide the fate of these forests and whether the birthrights of its animals and people have come to an end or will endure. Thank you.